I have a very interesting guest tonight, and for us to have this guy on is really a delight. So, without further ado, Richard Allen Miller is his name, and I have to say, this bio is just kind of blowing my mind. So, I'm actually going to ask him to introduce himself and to make some sense out of all of this, because he's been into too many things. I will say that it looks like he's worked for Above Top Secret at one time in his life, if I get that right. And I guess we're going to just go down the rabbit hole tonight. So, Rick, I think you go by Rick, huh? Yes. Engineers go by Dick, and physicists <laughs> go by Rick. I'm just kidding. <laughs> no, no. <laughs> that that might be accurate, actually. Uh, but at any rate, so Rick Miller, uh, welcome. And can you introduce yourself a, a lot better than I just did? Because, you know, well, I, let's I, start I love, with my childhood. I love That's bio. a good place to start. In my junior year in high school, my science fair projects in 1960 and 61 were used on the Mariner uh, 1 uh, flyby Mars in 1964 to measure the amount of water on Mars. Uh, that was in 64. As uh, What that did was have old man DuPont put a big bullseye on me when I was in high school. And they then orchestrated a series of educational moves for me and positions. When I, I, you know, they orchestrated my entire graduate work. I worked for DuPont the, in Wilmington and did my first graduate work at Delaware and then Princeton and MIT. I'm, my, uh, my doctorate is in resonance physics. I am considered, uh, uh, you know, emeritus in the world in resonance, uh, having, uh, finished Hainsworth's work on, on Schumann's resonance. Um, I worked out of anesthesiology. In the early years, when I went to work for Boeing, we started with Lunar Base Alpha-1, which was a scientific experiment on greenhouses growing pot on the moon. There's, a, there's an article on, you know, on my website on that. And then from there, I started up a program called SEAL Corporation, which was to take selected uh, individuals from Navy and turn them into supermen. And uh, I have written some books on how to do that, and I did so well in that area, moving with training astronauts and, and Navy SEALs. That's like SEAL unit number one. Then they moved me into MRU, which was called Mankind Research Unlimited, under Dr. Carl Schleicher. You do a Google on him, he's your man, that's the smoking man in the X-Files. They called me Spooky Miller because that's what I did. I did most of the paranormal studies for Navy out of anesthesiology at the University of Washington. I had a counterpart, Dr. Wilbur Franklin, that was at Kent State, and then, of course, Dr. Carl Schleicher was on Wisconsin Avenue. And he uh, was at that desk for 48 years. Oh, he was probably an alien, who knows. Uh, you know, he was, um, in his own way, responsible for a lot of uh, studies that are now, you know, written uh, in, as screen scripts for TV and things of that nature. I um, was basically uh, n unwilling to move to Hollywood, and so I ended up ha helping Chris Carter uh, write uh, most of the X Files. Basically, I was one of the advisors on set. I would I would go up to Vancouver and and actually tell him how it was. Our team, which was MRU, was basically a collective of unusual backgrounds. And we were basically a team. Whenever they encountered something they could not understand, they would bring us in and, uh, you know, basically try to see if we could figure out what was going on. We never did any more than anybody else because most of the things that we were brought in on are not knowable. I mean, <laughs> that's probably how that works. If you're dealing with an alien uh, that is, let's say, approaching God status or that cannot be known, uh, what are you doing? You, you know, you can conjecture. I think Carl Sagan said it best when he said aliens are actually from much further away and much closer than we realize. And his movie Contact, which used a vector equilibrium matrix to, to fall into a timeless spot, with cluster was exactly accurate. That is, as we understand it, how time travel works, applied in between dimensional physics. But... Uh, at that time, we knew, and this is in the early 70s now, we knew about aliens and things like that, 
Wayne Aho was around, you know, with Georgia Dembski and those people. But really, we were at that time way more worried about what the Russians were doing. And so there was a lot of emphasis on paranormal studies. We were looking for supermen. So, like, maybe one of the first studies I did was at the Manager Foundation with uh, Jack Schwartz. He was able to not feel pain when he'd stick needles in his arm and could stop bleeding. How does that work? Maybe he wanted to know how that works. And so in we went to try to figure it out. And in most cases, it was like catching flies. Our mouths were open in disbelief, and while we might have a theory, we had no clue, really. It's, you know, as bright as we were, you know, we still went up against, haven't got a clue. And, of course, even I had top-secret clearance with vault permits. They did not call above top-secret at that time. It was called vault permits. That would mean you could go into certain vaults without a need to know. And uh, the above top secret, I don't even know what that is. That must be something newer because when we had it, you had an orange badge, that means you were top secret as opposed to secret or classified. And then they would have green tags or buttons that would go on that, which was, uh, you know, vault permits. That's, as I remember, how it all worked. Okay. Well, that's very interesting. And clearly you got an incredible background. I'd like to sort of slow down a little bit and back up because I was wondering how you got into being a physicist when it seems that you also have taken a a turn somewhere along the line into consciousness. Oh, (laughs) well, yes. Um, My academic backgrounds are in physics. Uh, After 11 years with Navy, I uh, uh, realized what I was doing in terms of working out of anesthesiology. I was doing you know, uh, uh, synthetic. I, I was doing uh, drug studies, uh, chip implants, uh, and uh, uh, what are, what are microwave studies. When I realized that all of this stuff was being used as weapons, you know, Commando, Solo, some of the other projects that we developed, and as a result, I just walked away. It turns out that was part of the grand plan, and I became a dirt farmer. I went into agriculture, alternative agriculture. In the last 35 years, I've been farming, and it is only recently when I met and became friends with Nick Begich that he brought me out of retirement. I started writing for Nexus Magazine on some of the older things that I did, and now I'm starting to be more current. Um, Spirituality is um, not what you do, how you do it. There are uh, many different forms to God, and what I, uh, I was always a seeker, and so I was always aspiring toward meeting a teacher. A teacher can only take you as far as they themselves have been, and so you go out into the world looking for the most impeccable teachers that you can find, because that's all the further your knowledge base you're going to get from that person. Can I stop you right there? Because I know that one of your early days were spent, it says, writing field theory for Carillion photography. And if we could start with that, because somehow you got into the field of, as you say, building super soldiers, and I would consider that an above top secret enterprise. But at any rate, can you address how you wrote a field theory for Carillion photography? How that happened? Well, Basically, what we were doing, not like the great Randy, but we were going in to sift through all the myriad of conspiracies, rumors, theories, uh, phenomena, and sifting out what seemingly had viability for study and what was obviously a misleading situation. Carillion photography turned out to be, that was 1970, when I wrote a paper called The Physical Mechanisms of Carillion Photography, that Dr. Stanley Krippner had me publish that with some works with Bill Tiller and Edgar Mitchell, and that was in Energies of Consciousness, a book by Gordon and Breach. And basically, I prove, through a series of experiments, that Carillion Photography was basically a form of secondary emission of electrons, while it contained... uh, biological information in the radiance uh, patterns, uh, they were they were so con, con, uh, construed in such a manner that you couldn't sift one piece of information from another, and our research then took a left turn into bioluminescence, which does 
uh, create a rapid scan medical diagnostic device. Originally, those started as CAT scans or what we call MRI. Now we're using functional MRIs on brain waves of having to do with P300 waves, with our ability to stack information and encode slices of the brain through tomography of the brain that we can basically uh, uh, map out uh, certain kinds of things like brain fingerprinting, you know, for lie detectors, that kind of thing. Uh, and bioluminescence, okay. what you're basically doing is if you put the body in an electrostatic field, it will ionize gases being emitted from the body. Now, the body has 32 points on its body where different oils are secreted from your ears, around your nose, um, your your genitals, etc. There are armpits, African glands. There's a whole series of different uh, discharges off the body that if put in an electrostatic field contain information about internal state functions. And that was the direction then that the physics of Carilion photography went in. They're still doing it with Thelma Moss and some of the others that had originally done that, but it's, it was too complex. I actually got to meet Simon Carillion, uh in New York City at one point. The Russians were very superstitious, and so their research was what I would call hysterical is that the right word they they were they hair triggers they would go off on all kinds of things the best sciences during that era actually came out of yugoslavia there was cosmobiology that was yanup and his lunar sex cycle of the female there was some incredible studies coming out that were in you know very interesting and worthy of follow-up. Mine, uh, my latest book, the ESP Induction Through Forms of Self-Hypnosis, was based on Dr. Milan Rizl's works out of Yugoslavia. And uh, it turns out that all these different states of consciousness, that's why what I do is consciousness studies, all the different altered states of consciousness provide uh, abilities that you can do things in those states that you cannot do in a conscious state. And so to use altered states of consciousness as a tool became what we would call a power tool for military. We could train uh, individuals on how to use these altered states and function more precisely than if you were to just rely on a conscious state. Now, okay, and, th- uh, and this is also the sort of thing that they can use in competitive sports, isn't that right? Oh, yeah, you can use it in anything, including your own personal evolution, if you'd like. That's, you know, what I'm writing about now, rather than developing these as military tools, I'm going to suggest that, you know, the rapture never came and got me, and the only thing that's going to save my bacon is me, myself, taking personal responsibility for my own evolution. And so I have applied some of these power tools that I, you know, using biofeedback where you learn how to control your heart rate or pulse and galvanic skin response where you can, uh, like for a lie detector or uh, there's a variety, there's an electromyograph, pneumographs, other kinds of things that would feed back information so that you could learn how to control certain autonomic functions that would appear... They were paranormal by doing that. Sorry, we are going to go to a commercial right now, and we will be right back with Rick Miller. Thank you. And we are here with Richard Allen Miller. And, Rick, right before the break, we were talking about Carilion photography, also going into the area of using, I guess, some form of biofeedback to upgrade your body and yourself in, in all the different ways that are possible. However, I am interested in... If you, if you don't mind sort of staying in the area of your past and, and going down that road to understand what it is you did for the government. Okay. Um, the first thing that I did was that I developed a protocol for Navy SEALs that when they came to a fork in the road, they go right or left. And they didn't want it to go through consciousness, which allowed for mostly statistical inference, you know, flipping a coin in the air. They wanted something that had a three-sigma error coefficient, like they were talking on your commercial, a 99.9975% probability that the event or decision was correct. When you make that in a conscious state with your higher mind or your brain, 
basically what happens is that you create a series of scenarios like you do in chess where there is a doubt. And what you wanted to do was get into the lower uh, gut level of knowing and having more information, which apparently also appears to be outside space and time. That means you know what to do. The idea is how do you get access to it? We used hypnosis. We used a special uh, 10-second protocol where you would ask the question, go down into a state of consciousness, and then just simply act it. And that alone became the first protocol that was used to train Navy SEALs into being better decision-making. In other words, Navy SEALs were originally chosen on their intuition, not how strong they were or how many bridges they could blow up. Originally, they wanted individuals that when they had to go internal and make a decision, it was normally always correct. How do you do that? Okay, we went into a laboratory and discovered an altered state of consciousness, a very specific place where your ability in guessing increases 400 times over where you are right now. We call that ESP, but it's not really ESP. Uh, well, it could be. It's that we have other senses that we're not tuned into from a conscious state of mind. I'm right now working with a, a Kristen Marlowe. Where is he from? He's from a graduate student at uh, St. Louis Synesthesia Labs and UMSL uh, and the Philosopher's Forum. And basically... What they're trying to do is understand the different states of consciousness and how we translate those into our normal five senses. You know, in in extrasensory perception, you don't really, with clairvoyance, you don't really see something. It's how your consciousness is somehow uh, absorbing that information that you already have from other channels who knows where it came in and how it came in. How do you tap into those parts of your reality and then be able to act on them? And that was the first Uh, protocol. Let me ask you this, because I am an intuitive and I'm very familiar with what you're talking about. Now, what I would wonder, though, is have you heard of, first of all, Dr. Pete Peterson? Dr. whom? Pete Peterson. No. I remember I've been out and in the closet for 35 years and it's... Nick yes, Begich and uh, you know active. Duncan Rhodes and some of the others that are trying to get me out to talk and straighten out some of the misconceptions out there. No, I'm not familiar with him. All right. Well, he he would have worked back in the same time you did. I think you're even around the same age, possibly. Yeah, I'm 68. Worked out of Boeing. Okay, you might be a little younger than him. Uh, so I do have an, a very long interview with this man, and I'd love you to see it and then come back to me with your impression. Sure, sure. He also worked with the concept of super soldiers, although maybe from a different... Oh, um, I saw that interview with you. That was an individual that was at birth, uh, uh, you know, selected no, or something, I, and, and he a was a super person. soldier. I believe I saw that with you and your, uh, your okay, partner. No, that's a different person, him. though. I'm talking about a scientist who worked oh, on the okay. other side. okay, not you're, the you're super soldier himself that I saw that also. Yeah, no, this is a doctor who, who yeah. a physicist, uh, I believe, like yourself. Anyway, that that really doesn't matter. At this point, when you do what you do, did you deal with remote viewing? Were you aware of the concept of remote viewing back then? Remote viewing came later. That was Russell Targ. Our work was out of Stanford Research Institute. Bill Tiller worked for me, and it was Andrea Puharich that was one of my teachers. Um, and okay. basically, Targ came later with remote viewing. Remote viewing is not astral projection. I'm now... Right. I'm going to lay it down what it is. It's a form of PK phenomena, which means it's outside the body. And as such, is extremely risky to the individual or viewer. And there's a tremendous danger because uh, as you try to, let's say you're doing a remote viewing of Mars uh, and you encounter some kind of an entity, that entity because it's coming through a PK uh, mechanism of transport, uh, can actually cause changes in you and be very seriously dangerous. 
And okay, well, that was one of the, that, but, the but, but remote uh, viewing came in the 80s, and I, all of the work I did was in the early and, and mid-70s. We, okay. uh, Stanford Research Institute at that time was mostly run under uh, TARG, and uh, some of the others, actually, they came in 84 or 83, I think, okay, Let, much later. Kuda. We were into astral projection, you know, the Shirley MacLaine thing. With a silver exactly. throat and, cord, okay. and, you know the the relationship of taking your consciousness to location and taking the information. That the whole thing has to do with the way information is grouped into space time, and basically space time is a subset of a much more interesting universe, and is not really actually real. Lawrence Lashon. Uh, wrote a book called The Medium, The Mystic, and The Physicist, which talked about the three grand illusions, space, time, and ego. And basically, ego is uh, necessary for survival. It is a extremely important part of consciousness, but in the whole scheme of things, there's a little tiny dot down there on the left-hand side or something. It's not okay. very important in comparison to the whole of everything. And space-time okay. are the same. It me? has to do, um, space-time has to do with the way memory. Uh, Robert Ornstein says that time is a duration of consciousness. It's the fact that you have two brains and a new adult or a bottleneck moving information from one side, side of the brain to the other, and it creates a duration. And that's the way you wrap your proteins and store memory. And so you have a duration of consciousness, which you then call time. However, one of the things that we taught our Navy SEALs was how to change their perception of time, uh, where you would go from, let's say, Hangao, a form of dragon form of fighting, into a, uh, let's say, Tai Chi, where you experienced everything in slow motion. In fact, what was really happening is that you were uh, hallucinating, if you will, from a conscious state point of view, but enough that you could move with the precision of having the curvature in your hands be perfect for the blow that you were doing. And while it was in very normal, rapid time, you experienced it in slow motion because of an altered state that you would put yourself in. This is a technique that's used for advanced boxing. And uh, it's, you know, it's like that. Okay. Time isn't real. It's... Um, it's hard to that. relate to that, and of course, no, actually, when we get into a holographic universe and we you talk about epigenetics, we'll talk about super codes within structured geometry so that you have a way information collapses in on itself or out of itself, and space-time then do not become real. And that was okay. one of the first things we observed with psi energy was that it was independent of space-time. That was with the Edgar Mitchell experiments that I did when I was at Mission Control. Edgar Mitchell went to the moon and went around the moon, and we did ESP experiments at that time. They're fairly well known and led to my new book that I've written on ESP and how it works. Seemingly, as independent of space-time, how does that work? Well, you know, you got precognition and retrognition, where you see things from the past or in the future. Time and space in these forms of consciousness aren't as real and hold uh, a different subset of informations that allow you to make better decision making. Okay, very good. I wanted to know if you know Hal Pudoff. Yeah, I know. Yes, I, I knew him, yes, and, uh, and uh, several others from that whole area. There was, uh, yes, uh-huh. Okay, and did you ever meet Ingo Swan? Ingo Swan and Putoff were again also younger than me. I'm I kind of an ump grumpy old man. <laughs> I was okay, older, well, and we were doing okay. at that time what was called blue sky research, where in the eighties there was a change in protocols, and you had to have application. If 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 the research was not going towards something that could be used, they didn't fund it. In the 70s, okay. it was open and blue sky, and then in the 80s, everything changed. Okay, that makes sense. Did you know Edward Teller? Yeah, Bill. Edward Teller, no. I knew Bill Teller, and I knew Nettemeyer. Nettemeyer uh, worked with Teller, and Nettemeyer was at the UW and was one of the physics professors that worked under our program. 
We at that okay, time wasn't did the experimental uh, research wrong, uh, in, uh, in uh, parapsychology at the UW. Teller, uh, uh, Teller at Livermore Labs. Yeah, he yes. You're talking about William Teller with the bomb. Yes, that was at Livermore. Uh, Nedemeyer was his second in command and was at the UW. That's why I mentioned they were both older than me. I see. When you say at the UW, what is the UW? University of Washington. I'm sorry. Yes, that's right. <laughs> University of Washington, Seattle. That's Are where most of term? I did all the paranormal studies for the West Coast. Uh, Bill Franklin, Dr. Wilbur Franklin, was at Kent State and did everything in the Midwest, mostly out of the University of Chicago. And then Dr. Carl Schleicher ran everything on the East Coast. He would do Montauk and some of the other experiments that were East Coast projects. I did most of them on the West Coast. I did not meet Teller at Livermore, although we did a number of experiments at Livermore and China Lake both. They were all both Navy facilities. That's okay. whenever it was Navy, that term, was me. I, I want to ask you a question. The, the, are you familiar with the term information field? Um, super matrix field is what you're saying? You're like talking about Bearden and scalar physics? Well, I... I yes, I'm you are, yeah. Yes, it. in well, that I, sense I, of it, they don't call it that. Actually, it was Dr. <laughs> Charles Muses at MIT that called it hyperdimensional math. That was before string theory. And that's where we first started the physics of those alternate universes or parallel universes to be distinguished differently than resolutions of a hologram. Resolutions of a hologram, as opposed to a quantum universe, would see the universe in the way information, not space-time, would fold into or out of itself. And we were more interested in information which was outside space-time. In other words, it was a, uh, a more uh, developed set of information structures than space-time was. Space-time was illusionary, like uh, blowing a balloon up. You can put so much air into it, and the balloon gets larger and larger. And uh, that would be a bubble, if you will, in on a, on a string, like a little pimple or something. And that is basically what consciousness does, is it takes the possibilities or imagination and makes it reality. In other words, what we discovered is that all things that we perceive starts on the inside and is projected outward. In other words, it, it all starts with imagination, and you create what we would call thought forms. And with that model for the way reality worked, we could make Superman by using that as an assumed truth. If you used that model or universe, then there were things that you could do. For example, in a holographic universe, that would make the brain a four-dimensional hologram of five space, because it's an amorphous semiconductor liquid crystal phases, that kind of thing. That means that you can change the movie. Let me, let me ask you this. Would you say that your objective was to get out, when you say space-time, you're really talking about what we think of a, as possibly the 3D universe. Yes. And, and, and the, are yeah, you, the DNA, you if you the will, notion, is a three-dimensional hologram of four space. Holograms are an abbreviation like fractals. They are the way information folds into or out of itself. You start with a physical right. plane. You have above it an emotional plane, which is the way your subconscious and higher self tries to communicate to you, which means the emotional plane is actually the physical plane with more information. And then you have an intellectual archetypal. Timothy Leary called those uh, neurologic circuits and have now been called by other scientists memes or ways of categorizing events or information. The way you would okay. categorize it. Is this a physical thing or is this an emotional thing? All right, uh, we again have another commercial here. Sorry to interrupt you, Richard Allen Miller, and we'll be right back. Thank you. American Freedom Radio. This is Carrie Cassidy, Project Camelot Whistleblower Radio, and we're talking to Richard Allen Miller, a physicist and an explorer into the nature of consciousness, I would say. Rick, are you still there? Yes, I am. <laughs> All right. <laughs> By the way, uh, I loved it. You playing Jesse Colin Young. Je you know, Jimi Hendrix was going to Garfield when I was at Mount Rainier. We were the same age. 
And you were playing <laughs> Jesse Colin Young and the Youngbloods, and I haven't heard them in a long time. Oh, cool. Okay, very nice. Uh, well, we can thank my, my engineer for that. He's um, right on it. <laughs> my era. <laughs> anyway, what, what I was wondering is, are you familiar with Arthur C. Clarke? Yeah, Arthur C. Yes, I am. Uh, uh, Arthur know? M. Clark was uh, uh, a leader, and I have had the great pl- privilege of speaking at uh, conferences uh, where he was also a speaker in Chicago. Now, that's almost 40 years ago. Arthur M. Young, there was uh, a number of others, uh, Robert Ornstein, uh, some of the others that were pioneers in that area. Uh, Dr. Stanley Krippner was my mentor, that, and Andrea Puharic. I, uh, I th- those were the ones that trained me when I started working for Dr. Carl Schleicher. Okay, now let me ask you this. Did you have this, these techniques, did you have this ability yourself? In other words, you're a physicist investigating this. Did you have these abilities or not? Uh Yes, later, uh, basically anybody can do it. What I did is I developed the model, and then Nostica, back in Llewellyn's company back in, uh, they had these big Nostica conferences, they brought Dr. Rind in. Actually, they didn't bring him in, but the Foundation for the Study of Man, and they held this big ESP contest. Um, They brought in Gene Dixon, uh, Sybil Leak, all the usual suspects, and... Uh, then I was invited to participate in demonstrating the model and how well it worked. I won the event, of course. Uh, there is, uh, in the book and other things, uh, <laughs> discussions on how that all went down. Actually, by the third round, people were starting to worry because I was uh, way beyond even the best psychics. Out of a run of, let's say, 20, the average would have been, uh, uh, let's say, out of 20 was 1 in 4, so it would be 5, and most of your psychics were somewhere around 9 to 11. There was one that did a 13. I didn't have a single run that was under 15. Uh, Most of mine were 18 out of 20 or 19 out of 20, and uh, it isn't about me. It's about the technique that works. Okay. And, and so Matt, uh, Matt Stein and I are going to be doing a uh, series of workshops in Reno called uh, on the 14th, uh, the, the 11th, 12th, 13th, and 14th on critical decision-making power tools as used by Navy SEALs. We're gonna, I'm going to actually train civilians like I did astronauts and Navy SEALs. I'm going to run it through where, they, where what I do basically is uh, you, when I first meet you, like you, I would take a baseline measurement. I'd run a base on you to find out what your ESP levels are. And then I would teach you the protocols, take you through a series of guided meditations, hypnosis sessions, showing you where it is. And at the end of the day, I measure you again. And most people are at least 100% 200% above where they were when they first came in that morning. And I've had students actually win lotteries and other kinds of event things. But this is uh, really, if you're in the middle of, you know, a zombie is East L.A. when they're out of food. And when the grid does go down, and it will be going down because right now we are experiencing a major global event in weather change. It's happening as we speak. The media and people like, you know, interviewing and things have not yet truly picked up on the fact that the drought that the United States is experiencing or enjoying right now, 800 years of history since we've had anything like this. And it's going to get stranger in the next several years. There are reasons why this is all happening. It doesn't really matter what's going to happen or when. I would say it's time for a lifestyle change. Start with your water <laughs> and your food. Okay, and, and we can definitely go down that road with you towards the end of the program, but I, I still want to keep you on track here. And I've already got people saying they want, they want to come and, and learn your techniques. Have you thought of packaging this and putting it out on a DVD? Yes, that's next. I have the book, and of course I had a standalone article in Nexus Magazine that ran it down, ABC, here's how you do it. Basically, okay. it just takes practice. And once you start that program and keeping an honest journal, you know, diary, um, 
off you go. And really, it could probably save your life. Very interesting. Let me take you back again to the remote viewing because your description was was actually wrong in terms of what they put out to the public. And I wondered if you're just not aware of that. In other words, yes, what you're talking about is remote viewing is sort of a a way of bilocating and actually doing even more than bilocate, as you say, out of body, whatever you want to call that, while you're still conscious. And, and well, okay. Very, um, very, there very are doable. extrasensory wait, perception wait, has wait, been wait, classified into two question. categories, <laughs> coming from inside the body or outside <laughs> the body. Inside the body is called ESP, and outside the body is called PK phenomena. And right, well, I'm going to suggest that's, that's that sort of remote viewing term. is outside the body. And that was I, published in Emergent that. Mind Bulletin Online. Uh, with Leon Sideroff and some of the others. Basically, it is not astral projection. And as such, right from the early years that they started exploring with that, using drugs, it is extremely dangerous to the, the viewer. Okay, but it again, actually will cause changes in them that about, they're I, I not necessarily guarantee. wanting. Okay, I, I just want you to know that I've interviewed some people that are top teachers in this area, and I can guarantee you that they would not acknowledge what you've just said about their technique. Well, um, I was the government. We were the ones that were doing the studies. Uh, this is before even Russell Targ or... Yeah, or, I get uh, it. Uh, uh, and I appreciate Ingo Swan. that. And we, it was Bill Tiller <laughs> and uh, uh, Andrea Puharich and... Right. Uh, uh, that group down that was doing the primary studies at SRI, however, it was the University of Washington where we were actually doing the true studies on consciousness with altered states. Delgado was in a lab next to mine before he went to Yale. He was doing chip implants. Dr. Moore was doing ketamine, telepathine, and BZ studies, and I was doing the microwave, synthetic telepathy, mind control stuff. And I have recently written an updated paper on mind control, what, what what they're doing now. And it's unbelievable compared to back when we were using microwave. I mean, it has gone way over the edge. Um, and we can talk about that later if you'd like. No, the, I'm, I'm going to be div- right giving now. a talk no, on mind right. control, the same one I gave in Brisbane for, for the Navy. Uh, this last year I was uh, in, in uh, 2011, I went to Brisbane and delivered the new directions of mind control and possible defenses. And I have to tell you, it's unbelievable what is happening now. And uh, I'd like to say that. Oh, let's, let's, let's go there for a moment. Monsanto is the true Antichrist. Uh, originally, Monsanto was a weapons company that made 2,4-D and Agent Orange and later Paraquat as weapons for the military. And then later got into seed control and 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 uh, seed banks and then started doing gmos or genetically modified organisms what they did first was take transgenic soybean and uh, made it a delivery system for inoculations and you will read in the latest papers that are coming out right now that uh, uh yeah, they can use that now for children and in inoculating them rather than from a needle then three years ago uh, DOD project, this is a D- Department of Defense project, uh, authorized the studies of altering a specific gene in wheat that activates a bacteria in your gut that you got from a cat. Everybody's got it. If you've stuck your face up next to a cat, you have that infection in your body. It's a specific bacteria, and it's basically inert until this wheat product and this altered gene uh, activates it. When it gets activated, you become what I call a Walmart shopper. (laughs) You you change. And um, basically, your gut is a lower brain that is convoluted and has has neurotransmitters, and you do a lot of decision-making from your gut. And to realize that you are no longer what you eat, but rather you are whom you feed is a more accurate way to realize that one of the first power tools was to start with structured waters and the foods we ate because if you wanted to be a spiritual entity, you had to have a physical body to launch from. In fact, the physical body is in fact a 
uh, say, a, a scalar or analog of your higher bodies, spiritual. And so a fat doctor doesn't make any sense. Thank you. Uh, we've got a commercial again. I'm very sorry. We'll, we'll have to be right back. We'll continue with this. Thank you. Terry Cassidy, Project Camelot, Whistleblower Radio, and we're talking to Richard Allen Miller, a name you're going to start hearing everywhere, I think, <laughs> after this interview, <laughs> just because you sound absolutely prolific. Rick, are you there? Yes, ma'am. All right, very good. Hey, you worry about I'm, me. <laughs> I I'm know, sorry. I'm an old, grumpy old man. Sorry about that. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, look, we were just starting to talk about Monsanto and, and mind control. Uh, you were talking about... Uh, yeah, their no. Monsanto is a weapons company. They're not a GMO company. That's just one thing they do. You know, right. the interesting thing was they were under DuPont. I was basically working for old men DuPont, so I was a Jesuit for the Church of DuPont, and he reported to Rockefeller. That's all changed. Now with the New World Order... Monsanto owns DuPont. How does that work? Well, it's kind of like the U.S. Forest Service owns uh, uh, USDA. <laughs> you know, the little bureaucracy within the organization takes over. And that's basically, Monsanto is uh, a, a serious, serious, insidious problem. And people okay. uh, do not and, have a clue yet. You were going down some great roads right before the break. What I want to ask you here, I'm stumbling on your your work with Alan Frey uh, the, and, and where you got into this situation where I guess he had written or did you jointly write the holographic no. concept? Of Alan Frey was at Willow Grove. He, he was out of Willow Grove. He's working for um, uh, uh, a different government agency and uh, had made this discovery by accident. It then went across Dr. Carl Schleicher's desk, and Schleicher sent it to me for comment. That's when we suggested, oh, this would be perfect for mind control. And off they went, studying the 0.3 to 3 gigahertz. That's what Alan, Alan Frey had discovered that man had another sensory motor input. Basically, what the microwave band did, uh, and I'm writing about that right now, that what it did was that it, it uh, caused the temporal lobes to heat up slightly and become more compact, and they began to ring. Once they began to ring, you could take the microwave bandwidth and heterodyne voices onto it, and people could actually hear those voices in their head, just like Son of Sam or something of that nature. Right. And the problem was many people do not have what we call inner uh, uh, plain experiences of consciousness, and so they have no idea whether a voice that's inside their head is coming from them or from something outside themselves. <laughs> and so, okay. of course, the first mode of defense is to simply say, like the Hopi Indian, man has a responsibility for the thoughts he chooses to entertain. In other words, whether that thought came from you or that thought came from somewhere else, why are you choosing to hold it in your mind's eye? Absolutely. Well, okay. there it is. Uh, now, Read it in the way. That's the plea. And so you started training SEALs and special forces with uh, these concepts so that they could use their belief systems as a tool rather than a driver. If you were a staunch Christian and two aliens walked in the door, the big question is, would you be able to see them? And uh, now, with all of that said, uh, belief systems are important to all of us and, you know, assume truths. They're arbitrary, it turns out, and most people don't even know where they came from. They just assume they're correct. You know, Jesus said it, I believe it, and that's that. But with that said, I have a pair of bell-bottom pants I'm never going to fit in again. But I still keep them like a belief system as a reminder. They may not be appropriate for what I'm trying to do. And so you fold them up nice and neat, and you put them in the drawer to pull out later because they're familiar and comfortable with you like old clothing is. And that's basically what I did. One of the power tools was to train SEALs how to change their belief systems like they would a pair of clothing. Now, in order to do that, you have to be able to witness your behavior. That's a different altered state, and why all the saints have throughout history told 
uh, every the public the importance of meditation and training the mind. That's basically it's like an unruly little child. It runs all over the place. And of course, the thoughts you choose to entertain are what ha- happens. And so, if you have a doubt, there it is. Merlin put it very succinctly when he said, "Anything not specifically forbidden is mandatory." That was in a little book by T. H. White, and that concept applies you know whatever is possible you can count on it so what you're trying to do is move through the course without ricocheting off walls or creating karma you're trying to slide through things smoothly how do you do that it's called flowing there is a technique that you can do that will allow you to touch some part of your inner being that has more knowledge than your conscious state does okay uh, let me ask you this. I'm noticing here that there was a second paper that you wrote, and you gave the paper at, as it happens, uh, California State College at Sonoma. Oh, embryonic University, uh, and, and I'm reading it. Uh, and you were dealing with an AI database for paranormal... Yes, we had the first which, uh, artificial intelligent computer with a 360 at the University of Washington. It had serendipity and synergy access protocols and this was way before we had concepts of quantum algorithms quantum computation algorithms and some of the other forming networking that we have today and what I did that was called project Terrafile, where we created uh, and that's not been written out so I don't know where you found about that but that's interesting yes we did (laughs) that at the Omniversal at the same time I presented a second paper called embryonic holography which was an application to the holographic concept of reality and the holographic concept of reality then became uh, uh, a model that has been used by the military for understanding the universe even over that of a quantum universe Entanglement, the quantum universe will have entanglement and decoherence. And that's where you can have a particle that is simply related to another particle, and they could both be at opposite ends of the universe, but the one is somehow related to the other. That is called the Bose-Einstein condensate. In a holographic universe, we would suggest that it is the same particle with two cameras on it. So you're getting two levels of a hologram and you're confusing planes and that is a more accurate way to approach uh, the universe as holographic in nature and that okay. part uh, the embryonic holography showed how it applied to biological processes uh, from L- L- rabbits and burr out of uh, Northridge uh, and several other universities Yale uh, Northrop and Burr were at Yale uh, Rabbits was at uh, Northridge. There were others that were doing these concepts, which led to the map that you're familiar with now called fractal map. Uh, basically, if a hologram is a certain size, like a Mendelbrot ge- generator, the next size up is has a specific size to it or dimension, just like going from the physical plane to the emotional plane, intellectual plane. And these are all centered around the geometry of specific neurotransmitters, like lysergic acid amide or N, N hyphen dimethyltryptamine or ketamine or some of the other brain chemistries that we have similar to designer drugs that we take. Okay, but I also noticed that one week after you delivered this paper at Sonoma State University, which is actually a school that I graduated from. Oh, wow. That was a long time ago. That was during the Cohotec Conference, is what it was called, when we thought the Earth was going to get hit by a comet called Cohotec. I see. And uh, four men came into your place of business, it says, uh, two in suits and two in full army army dress, and uh, put you under arrest. Oh, um, yes. What happened was I was working for Navy Intelligence, and Army Intelligence came into Seattle and took all my files. The paper that I sent to you, if you have a copy of the embryonic holography, was written a second time because the first version of that was classified top secret, and I had no notes to work from other than my memory. (laughs) And that was when it was first published in Psychedelic Essays and Monographs out of... Uh, Boca Raton, a long time ago. 
Okay, but you wrote the paper, the original paper, and they classified it so that you couldn't even see it. Isn't that That's right? right. Yeah, that's how it works. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. Okay. yeah, I've been yeah, there and done that. That's frequent. That's often very frequent because uh, you might make a... Um, Mm, a suggestion of how the brain, my, in my paper, how the brain processes information, and at that time, it was essential. That was the key element for understanding how synthetic telepathy might be used. By the way, synthetic telepathy now is the primary first ordinance used by everything. If you look at Afghanistan and they list all the ordinances, the airplanes and the bombs and the rifles and the bullets and everything that were used, at the very top, uh, before anything happened on both invasions of Iraq, for example, was, uh, was Commando Solo, and that's that single aircraft. And you can go on Wikipedia and read about it. It's all using synthetic telepathy. Okay, and when you're talking about synthetic telepathy, can you please describe exactly what that is? Yeah, that was Alan. It was all based on Alan Frey's work. Yes, ma'am. Okay, but specifically because you're talking about synthetics. Well, it's working a microwave. In other words, we were. It's it's not really us. Pay what it, what we were doing was uh, causing the uh, temporal lobes to. Uh, ring and 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 once they ring you could heterodyne voices on the base carrier form of the microwave band and you could actually hear them in your head without going through processes that had to do again with resonant physics and the way biological organisms will scale up or scale down something in but terms of amplification of information are resonant cavity oscillators i believe is the right word to use you're talking about turning soldiers, getting them to take orders? To no, um, mostly it would be uh, as a communication system if it, everything went down. That's why they developed HARP as well. Eslin and some of the others, when we were involved in that, they, they wanted to use my frequency bands, and they wanted to put a second uh, station after Nick Begich wrote Angels Don't Play This Harp. He's my publisher, by the way. Uh, when, they, when they did that, then the second facility, when Europe started going sideways on the whole thing, was down in Australia, in central Australia, near Adelaide. And what they were doing was trying to set up a global uh, 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 screen of these frequency bands uh, like you would an ongoing commercial in your head all the time. You couldn't turn it off. And uh, it didn't work. Uh, in fact, what did happen is even more weird uh, with HARP. But um, there, uh, my website will have some recent blogs on, on how it's messing up the ionosphere and how it pushes this way and it causes that. I do not think that the global events of weather change that we are currently enjoying is related uh specifically or wholly to HARP. I believe it is part of a much larger problem of, of, of a small group of people trying to control the weather. Okay, and but let are me you tell you, with uh, the they can control the weather now. Are you familiar with the nano satellite grid? The which? Nano? Nano satellite grid. No, I'm not. What is that about? Oh, have you ever heard of Mother? <laughs> No, I, okay, now you're getting into areas that I, you know, realize I'm just out of the closet. I have okay, been well, in recluse for 35 years. Uh, right, now well, what I'm doing for Navy, I'm back working for Navy Intelligence, of course. Uh, you never really get out of that club. I have a handler. Well, Actually, <laughs> he refers him to himself as a wrangler. You know, a wrangler is uh, the person that handles small children and animals on set. And they consider me a loose cannon. So basically what I do now is I network rural communities and bunkers for congressmen like Dennis Kucinich. Kucinich would refer to me as the postman because I have a photographic Well, it isn't a photographic memory. What I have is an eidetic memory, very special. And as such, uh, uh, it makes me kind of weird because I don't forget anything. I'm like a four-year-old that never became seven. I just... I, I have the same inquisitive, I'm going to check out, Mother. You can count your socks on that one. <laughs> Find out what that's all about, nano-satellites. Okay, well, I'm thrilled to death to hear that because I love it when uh, I, can, I can get a, a person I'm talking to, to to connect the dots. 
And uh, because I talked to so many different people, if, if they would only talk to each other, we'd really get somewhere. <laughs> well, you know, that's what you're so good about. And I would think you're a more interesting person to interview than even <laughs> May because of all the weird people you have interviewed. Uh, you can only guess what you think. Uh, I think, <laughs> I think you're, you're really, uh, you're, you're one of the, the top type of interviews that I would ever prefer to do, to tell you the truth, because you're, you've got an incredible vast knowledge in your brain and it's just a matter of getting to it. Pulsed microwave is what you call this voice to, to skull transmission. Uh, that is correct. On. What they would do, the frequency band was 0.3 to 3 gigahertz. And what that band, low amplitude, which means you can use it in space. You don't need sound. And uh, this is like an advanced communication system in man that has basically not been developed or noticed until recently. And so, right. of course, like diet and all the rest of it, can we use this to manipulate the masses? Yes, of course you can. Because with awareness, then comes, you know, the potential of defenses and how to, you know, strategize. But as it stands, uh, the pulsed microwave radiation, what that does is it, 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 it stimulates and heats up. Literally, it's like your temporal lobe is like a piezoelectric crystal. It's like a liquid sack of, of, of um, fluids. Actually, they're amorphous semiconductors, to be precise, which means there's something far more interesting going on there than just uh, being a sack of fluid getting heated up in a microwave oven. And that's basically what happened. The temporal lobes would start to ring from being heated. They would, they would swell and heat. Seems like there's no toxicity or LD50 ratios on that. And in the studies I saw, in the early studies, we couldn't find any problems with it. Low amplitude, causing it to ring. Now, once the, the, the temporal lobe was ringing like a, like a little bell, then you could heterodyne voices you know, audio, onto that carrier, and you can hear it in your head through, we don't know yet, that's still unknown, what kind of resonant cavity oscillators are stepping it up as biological amplification so you can hear it. Okay, uh, we've got a commercial, we'll be right back. This is Carrie Cassidy, Project Camelot, Whistleblower Radio, and we're talking to Richard Allen Miller, all about mind control and consciousness and a, and a whole slew of other things from a very sophisticated perspective, I have to say. Rick, can you continue to talk about how the mind control is, is actually being used? And, and I, I understand that your understanding or perhaps uh, being up to date on what HARP can and can't do might be somewhat limited. At least that's the way you co you're coming across with this at the moment. But if you understand, for example, the use of television in this in this scenario, how would you place that? Well, I, I, I could give you a direct quote from the CIA. Uh, mind control. We don't we don't need mind control. We have TV. <laughs> That's a direct quote <laughs> from the seventies. Okay. Uh, I don't know if you watch your 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 husband or your neighbors when they watch TV and how they start to drool and their eyes glaze over. And uh, <laughs> there is a mindlessness to it that uh, engages other parts of your brain. And that's why we call it the Mozart effect, for example, when everybody loves classical music. Why? Because it is exercising portions of the brain that have not otherwise been exercised and it loves it and so it can't get enough of it and tv is a similar thing it's activating your occipital region of the cerebral cortex which is where most people relate to reality is visually and uh rather than audio and uh audio is a second major input feelings are a third one but you know we have many many different senses even at the foundation uh, when Dr. Ryan moved across the street and it became the foundation for the study of men, it was the big house where they put all the weird children, and did those studies. That place was always interested in uh, the paranormal forms of consciousness and what people could do when they were in certain states or altered states of consciousness. It, uh, okay. the, 
You know, God gave you these things as gifts. They're not to be shunned. Absolutely. Be I would agree with you 100%. Uh, can you please talk a little bit more about what house across the street where they put the special kids? Uh, the foundation. Um, okay. During the studies at the Foundation for the Study of Man, which is in Durham, across the street, it was a four-story building, uh, just like in the movies, and it <laughs> had kids... Young kids. I was taken there in the 50s myself because of my memory thing. My sister and I. My mother was a real famous psychic in the 30s. They did, uh, she had worked with my grandmother on uh, Seattle Police Department finding bodies and things. And they did a, a TV series called One Step Beyond. And so, of course, in the 50s, they went through and tested the children to see if there were genetic uh, relationships to ESP. There wasn't, but... In doing so, they discovered I was a fourth-stage telepath. That means that I can, with my thought alone, uh, uh, you know, I can, I can make you see things in your mind's eye. You can see it. You can get it. Once you can see something in your mind's eye, it becomes real. And it doesn't matter. It's like magic. Magic is a higher form of physics. It was reserved for the ultra-elite of Europe for centuries. It was only this last century when Crowley advocated the use of drugs as a valid form of magic, which it is, has a lot of danger and risks, and realize, uh, you know, I always like to end that talk with Crowley uh, dying as a drug addict in Hastings. And remember I said a teacher can only take you as far as they themselves have gone, and Crowley died as a drug addict. So back then... They didn't even understand things like addiction or what that truly meant. Laudanum and the use of certain kinds of morphine derivatives uh, at that period of time in, in history was relative. I mean, people knew that it wasn't right, but they didn't have the definitions of what really is going on. Um, it's interesting because, for example, uh, there's a friend of mine, Rick Strassman, has uh, written a book about uh, 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 witch burnings in France and in the 17th century. And every single witch burning, was a he was able in that period, in that area, was able to be traced to ergot poisoning. In other words, people had gotten poisoned with ergot in the bakery and were hallucinating, had no concept of what a hallucination was about, and of course thought they were involved with the devil. And, of course, the Catholic Church, that's the last chapter in Strassman's book, suggests that uh, the Catholic Church was using LSD, or ergot, uh, in ritual 100 years earlier and were perpetrating this misconception of what altered states were about as a way to control the populace. Today, we're doing the same thing with our foods. And uh, I, it's unbelievable because people have no concept that the body, body, if you look at the physical body, human body, it's mostly bacteria. Very little of it is human. I would say less than 10% is you, and the rest of it are all these different bacteria and water transport systems vying for a level, level ball field. That is why homeostasis for everybody is quite different. And it comes down to your diet because it's, it's not you are what you eat, but whom you feed. And in terms of you are what you eat, that would be audio, which means even if something were wrong, one of the first things we would train a Navy SEAL is not to say it, because saying it would make him hear it, and that would reinforce that part of the belief system or a doubt or the possibility of something. And so, uh, you know, there, right. you had to be very careful. You, a man had a responsibility for what he says, Man has a responsibility for the thoughts he chooses to entertain. I mean, there's a whole list of Hopi uh, proverbs, if you will, that's where they came from, that basically teach one how to become a superman by controlling your thoughts. And your thoughts are what create your reality. And uh, it's called thought forms. And uh, the mathematical equations of consciousness that are in my ESP book, they all came from Yugoslavia and basically uh, looked at uh, thought forms as durations of energy going into a, a question or a thought form, and the more you do it, 
the stronger it comes out. I believe they called that in tantric yoga sex magic. The thought that occurs at the moment of climax happens. That was the principal centered forms around magic and how to create or change realities. You could use that sexual energy. In voodoo, they used blood. It was all working with higher forms of emotions above the physical plane. And then, of course, there are higher planes to that as you become more integrated with internal uh, structures and, you know, your internal landscape. Absolutely. Very, very well said. And I think that great food for thought, literally, for, for the people listening. I want to back up to where you were talking about being a fourth stage telepath and your ability to really materialize what you think. Um, it has or, to do with your intensity of yes. concentration and the ability to focus in on something and to the exclusion. In other words, in yes. hypnosis, we would say everybody is in a light state of hypnosis. Obviously, they're listening to this radio show and what I'm having to say, but there are sounds around you from outside, your dog barking, whatever, that are distractions. And so really, everybody is in a state of hypnosis. What we talk about as significant is the depth of hypnosis. And there are markers, biological markers, where you can do an ontology of the depth of hypnosis. When you're in this state, your fingers are numb. When you're in that state, your nose goes numb. You know, that kind of thing. And what you're looking at is trying to exclude the external data from the internal focus. And if you, and that's okay. the depth of hypnosis, and that's where the thought forms come. And if you have a very directed individual like myself, I'm a four-year-old that is now... 68 years old, then imagine what my mind can do when I choose to focus on something. Okay. And that and, is where yes. all of it starts, right there. And everybody can do it. I'm not special. I agree. But let's say witches, so-called witches, and other people that have used some of, of these abilities are used to seeing things materialize almost instantaneously in this way. And I have to say, there's a television show called Alphas, which yeah. uh, features... <laughs> yeah, uh, that exists. That, 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 okay, Alphas are what, you know, is a metaphor for what was happening at the foundation. What they were doing was they would find children that had special gifts, like your remote viewing. And then they would try to enhance and develop that using drugs and or guided meditations and other toys. And yes. what happened next was those that were doing remote viewing projects for the government were having serious psychological changes and, and, and events happening that were hurting them. And we couldn't understand that until Lynn Sideroff in her Emergent Mind Bulletins decided to write on the mechanisms, and that's when it was discovered that because of the way the phenomena worked, it was part of a PK phenomena or outside the body. That means it's something else causing changes, not you. Now, how does that work? Well, um, that's an interesting uh, uh, talk because in Jungian psychotherapy, they would suggest that your daughter is not real, but simply a younger, feminine uh, part of yourself that you're having dialogue with. And that's how bad you're hallucinating on reality. That's Jungian psychotherapy. And they either say that various archetypes and gods that are working, you're either possessed or you're complexed. <laughs> you're, you either have one god, in which case you're, you're possessed, or you're complexed, which means you have several stories. The Greek had mythology that would use these stories of uh, human gods, you know, like Psyche at the Well of Souls. And, and what would happen is, if you could identify which story you were participating in, you would know how the ending is, and if, if that was not the way you wanted things to end, you okay. could change the story. That was called path working or the use of the tarot, the 28 big stories in the city. It was yes. a way to kind of group uh, mythology with the physical plane and finding an analogs on the never-ending stories. 
that okay. we have. We uh, have 28, but, but, supposedly, big stories, according to the Greek. And the reason I liked the Greek pantheon over Egyptian was that it was more humanistic and easily identifiable, whereas trying to relate to Ra yeah. and Osiris, which were more animalistic or more deeper subconscious concepts of archetypes, were more difficult to work with. Okay, can I stop you right there because I've got to cover a couple things. We are actually going to run out of time here, not too far ahead, and, and we also could take some questions from the audience. We have quite an active audience. Okay, good. Shows. Cool, cool. Fine. And I'd love to so respond like to, to questions. To That's what I do best, actually. Uh, direct questions. But before I do that, I must ask you, according to talking about synthetic telepathy, and you say, according to Dr. Robert Becker, synthetic telepathy has applications in covert operations designed to drive a target crazy with voices, deliver undetected instructions to a programmed assassin, etc. Now, you also talk about this technology has, having contributed to the deaths of 25 defense scientists that were employed by Marconi, this is very important because I've been interviewing David Griffin about this story, about the death of the Marconi scientists in connection with the Falklands War uh, and things that were discovered in the Falklands, et cetera, et cetera. Are you aware of the Falklands situation, and can you elaborate on what you think caused the deaths? Um, yes and no. I'm um, not as active in that area because I, I stopped my research in that area in the 70s, and this is 40 years later. Um, the, there's a lot of conspiracies out there. Most of them always have some kernel or thread of truth to them, but then are you know mutated into people's imagination. Um, I don't know much about that uh, at this point. I, you know, okay, well, I'm a me, newbie in that. You, you got to remember, you. I left everything in '81 and became a dirt farmer. And yeah, since '81 so. through now, I have basically been farming alternative agriculture. Now okay. that's a good thing too, you know, because this very moment in time will probably be the only time in history where physics and agriculture where food is taken out of the uh, monetary system and becomes a barter system that will man will most likely survive. I think community gardening uh, and the idea of uh, food being as a divine right as water, where they're trying to privatize water, that's crazy. It's like the air you breathe. You have to pay a tax on it now. That's nuts. And food no should be like, re man managed much like... Uh, oh, uh, parks are in a city. You choose a city that you're going to live in because of the types of parks that it has. <laughs> okay, we'll be right back uh, with Rick Miller. Thank you. Join together to bring the vision of peace and love into reality because we are the future, we are the heroes, and that we are who we have been waiting for. This is Carrie Cassidy, Project Camelot, Whistleblower Radio, and we're talking to Richard Allen Miller. Uh, fascinating man and uh, obviously we just don't have enough time to interview you completely here and so I would love to have you back I would also like to maybe arrange a more complete interview without interruptions at some point Rick, sure, we were talking about the Marconi scientists and I do understand but, but with somebody who has already acknowledged that they have uh, what did you call it, an eidetic memory? Eidetic, uh, eidetic, E-I-D- Eidetic. Yes. It's photograph. It's like a photograph. What I do is I, like a four-year-old, I take pictures and then can bring the picture back up and see the detail behind I understand. what I was so photographing. So what I'm asking you to do is use that memory here on my question. What you do say in your article here is that uh, most of the science worked on highly sensitive electronic warfare programs for NATO, including the uh, what is called SDI. And uh, I have recently read some material that indicates that SDI's real, real use was as a, a development tool uh, to develop weaponry to deal with the, let's say, the hostile alien or <laughs> and some low planet uh, entities that have, have invaded our, our, uh, our lives in, and also from the underground. 
So these people were driven to suicide. It's very clear by the manner in which they died that they were driven to suicide by something. Okay, so yeah. I, I, what I'm going to say is I was actually one of the things I did is go to Antarctica. And in Antarctica, there is a cave there that literally, I've seen it, is literally a mile high. It has weather. There is um, an underground earth through tunnels. I manage a bunker right here in Grants Pass. The so-called thousand-year war with the Nazis, uh, where we didn't actually win the war. Uh, they went underground. Uh, I don't know anything about any of that. What I do know is what I've seen, and I have been to Antarctica. I have seen that cavern, and so I know that it exists. And I do manage bunkers and have been to the Midwest, uh, you know, to Wichita and some of the other places where you have underground bunkers and networking. There's one bunker here in Grants Pass, Oregon. There's a, a book out called uh, Secret Bases and Underground Bunkers or something like that. I think I, I can't remember the title. There's a whole chapter on the yeah. city where I live, Grants Pass, Oregon. Okay. And this one bunker, I saw one bunker here that was poured with the same concrete the bridges were in 1912. That means the bunkers have been around a long, long time time and uh, are well documented as military uh, communications whatever and uh, there is one artificial tunnel going up from Evans Creek in near Medford uh, all the way down to High Pond, which is four and a half hours by motorcycle underground tunnel Whoa. and uh, the, the whole place is honeycombed and <laughs> yeah. I don't believe that the general populace realizes the extent of underground. Now, why are we doing underground? Well, the primary reason is plutonium. And we haven't even talked about Fukushima or Reactor 4 and the hazards that that's creating. Right now, during the presidential debates, which is a joke in one sense, because none of the 18 candidates running for president, and that includes Ralph Nader, have addressed the serious question of Reactor 4 at Fukushima. And right now, today, that water, it's, it's leaking. I mean, you know, there, there's water that's running across those exposed spent rods of plutonium, and the sea right outside of Fukushima right now today is 287 times higher than it was before that event. And San Francisco milk right now, the cesium-137 levels in in, in milk from San Francisco is 100% above EPA uh, standards. And FDA came out a couple months back and said that those numbers are arbitrary and that you should have no feeling or worry about it. However, what I know is that there is an epidemic of thyroid cancer from children that were born from 1950 to 1970 because of the Utah above-ground experiments. And that radiation got into the milk and went across... Of North America, and now there are one in four people that were born from 1950 to 1970 have thyroid problems, and it's all directly related to radiation, and that is what Mars was about. It was our get-out-of-jail card, and it turns out Mars has more water on it than Earth does. Okay, Did you know uh, that? Uh, well, no, not. I knew it had water. I didn't know it had more water. Than it has. Uh, when funny. they do a picture of the Earth and the Moon, and they put a little ball between the Earth and the Moon, and that's the amount of water that's on the Earth, the ball is bigger for Mars. And why? The water on Mars is a structured new form of water called at 100 degrees below zero. It's in a, um, a slushy, semi-liquid form about six inches below the surface. That is what they have just discovered. There's enough water that if the plutonium... Plutonium is a planetary killer. It isn't strontium-90. It isn't cesium. It's plutonium and that half-life is 100,000 years. Now, I got a chance two weeks ago to meet uh, John Hutchinson, who has the so-called Hutchinson effect. He's over in Gold Beach, yes. and he came over, and we met. And he's doing some radar experiments that use some kind of outer orbital stimulation, which causes the, 
the half-life of radioactive materials to degenerate quicker than normal by exciting the outer realm, uh, outer electrodes in, in the orbitals. And we don't know exactly if it really works or not, but bioremediation is a serious issue, and I notice that nobody is talking about it. Okay. And I don't uh, understand that. Very good. Yeah, absolutely. Well, uh, we, we are talking about the effects of Fukushima, certainly, and I would certainly say that you're right on track there. We don't have very much time here, but I'm going to ask you, one person in the, in the audience is talking about what they call the Lily Wave, which uh, Patrick you're talking about John Lilly? talks about. John Lilly, yeah. Yeah. He's and, David uh, the Dolphin. <laughs> I was the prodigy that Carl Sagan used to go into John Lilly's lab to determine what language the dolphin were using. It, as it turns out, I was there 10 days. Uh, and discovered that they are using a form of Clifford algebra, dimensional math. Their redundancy coefficient for the dolphin is ten times more efficient than Hebrew. I speak old Hebrew. I, uh, the languages are a thing I do. And and and, and the higher on the food chain is Orca that has a cerebral cortex that's literally twice the size of man, and the studies are now showing it's firing 60% of its cerebral cortex. Now that, by my definition, is a god, not our god, but going places in consciousness that man will never know. And there are four cetacean on this planet right now that are more highly evolved technically than man, in my opinion. And that field is called cybernetic anthropology, having to do with Laughlin, D'Aquili, and McManus, and it has to do with the idea that man had fire and a thumb, and that the dolphin, right now, what the dolphin are doing, lower on the food chain, the Norca, is blowing these little sonar bubbles that are called sonoluminescence, only just recently duplicated at MIT as a form of cold fusion, and that is their form of art. Man doesn't have a clue what we're doing here. And the consciousness part of it is so limited in terms of fear and ego that we miss the forest in the trees. And the, I've, I've seen videos of elephants painting themselves and their concept of self-image and how others would see them is far beyond that of men. Uh-huh. You okay. know what I'm talking about. I, I, you know, the, the gorilla uh, uh, and the studies that have been done with these different mammals, um, the, the gorilla, when interviewed, has a concept of an entity above himself of what they refer to as God. And uh, so when you talk about soul and you talk about awareness and man's scheme in the whole thing, Gaia is most likely Michael Rizia as a quantum computation algorithm. There are all kinds of things going on in this earth that we have not even begun to look at yet that are critical for our survival. And if that plutonium isn't addressed immediately, there is a likelihood that all life on earth will cease. That's why the we were never interested in the moon. It didn't even have cheese on it. But Mars had water has more water than Earth. Okay. Uh, Well, thank you for that. Uh, So in in terms of, I guess, just to to, to wrap the John Lilly uh, side of things up, you actually were taken in there as a child, what, a child prodigy? No, I I was in my 20s. I worked for Carl Sagan. I had I was a known entity for languages, and they want they brought me in to try to determine what the language was. That's the only participation I did with John was work on their language, the clicks and whistles, and literally it is a form of Clifford algebra, uh, algebra, and so that means their communication and the bundling of information and right. redundancy was even more efficient than even Hebrew, which is considered by Abram Moles and others to be, you know, aesthetic perception, you know, and information theory. Uh, Yes, absolutely. Okay, uh, we're at the end of the show. I'm very sorry to say thank you so much, Richard Allen Miller. I hope we can do this again soon. Do you want to give out your website or anything else? Yeah, my website is richardallenmiller.com. And right there on the uh, 
on the portal page uh, is uh, a listing of different events that I'm doing with Matt Stein. I understand Matt is the one that introduced you and me. Um, you've Wonderful. had him on your yes. show, I believe. And so, yes, and I'm going to have him on the show very soon in the future. Thank you again so much. I, I know people have really enjoyed hearing from you. Let's do this again very, very soon.